Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Allison Schilling, the Manager of Public Programs here at the Concord Museum. I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's forum with astrophysicist Sarah Seeger. The person who the New York Times called the woman who might find us another Earth bears no justification for why she's included as one of the remarkable women of Concord featured in the museum's special exhibition Every Path Laid Open, The Women of Concord and the Quest for Equality. The title of, of the exhibition comes from Margaret Fuller, who described in her 1845 treatise, Woman in the 19th Century, that the ultimate goal of women's suffrage would be to have every path laid open to woman as to man. Fuller may not have expected that those paths would extend into other galaxies, but here we are with a woman doing just that. I hope you get a chance to visit the exhibition to see Professor Seeger's portrait and the photos of other contemporary women of Concord who are fulfilling Margaret Fuller's vision and creating opportunities for the next generation. Alongside some of the treasures from the museum's collection, that are being displayed for the first time in years. Our speaker this evening, Sarah Seeger, is a professor of physics and planetary science at MIT. Her research, which earned her a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant, has introduced many foundational ideas to the field of exoplanets. She led NASA's probe class study team for the Starshade Project, She's now on the forefront of searching for the first Earth-like exoplanets and signs of life on them. Tonight's program will not be a deep dive into planetary science, though we hope to hear some of the exciting research that you're doing. Instead, we'll be discussing Professor Seeger's acclaimed memoir, The Smallest Lights in the Universe, which has been described as an exploration of outer and inner space. Professor Seeger is joining us from her home in Concord. Our moderator this evening is Tom Putnam, the Edward W. Kane Executive Director at the Concord Museum. As always, we thank everyone who has tuned in to watch tonight's program. If you wish to submit a question, please do so in the chat on YouTube, and I'll relay those questions to Tom. At the end of the forum, we'll raffle off a copy of Professor Seeger's memoir here, which, um, which we'll send to someone who participates in the chat. We hope you'll join us again on Thursday night for a forum with historian at the Harvard Business School, Nancy Kane. We'll be discussing women who have led through great adversity. So thank you, and I hope you enjoyed tonight's program. Thanks, Allison, and thank you, Sarah, so much for joining us, for allowing us to have your portrait in our new exhibit. I really, uh, I so enjoyed reading the book um, and uh, recommend it highly to our viewers. And I thought I'd begin uh, with the opening image uh, where you describe the phenomenon of rogue planets, which you write are given that name because they're, they're not anchored in space and instead can be found, quote, lurching across the galaxy like a rudderless ship wrapped in perpetual darkness. And what you do so beautifully in the book, and it feels almost effortlessly, I'm sure it wasn't, um, I'm sure it took a lot of effort, is to use these scientific metaphors in parallel to your own life story. For there were times that you described so beautifully in the wake of the death of your first husband that you yourself felt rudderless and perhaps wrapped in perpetual darkness. So. My first question is less about that experience per se, uh, we may touch upon that later, but more about what prompted you uh, to write a memoir and to share, share such a personal story with the wider world. Well, I hope we'll get to this perhaps later in the conversation. And in fact, the book also opens up at Nashada Hill. Uh, I think I, anyone on this call who's from Concord will know where that is. <laughs> it's where the kids all go sledding in wintertime. And a remarkable thing happened to me here in Concord at that hill that I met a group of widows and they were all the same age, all with kids. And it was a crazy, crazy lifestyle. I know a lot of people now are touched by tragedy, but back then it just felt like no one else. It's not true, but it just felt like no one else had suffered loss. And those are the humor and the dark humor. And I felt, I asked the other widows, 
are any of you writing a book? I don't remember what they answered in, in all fairness, mm -hmm. uh -huh. but I felt compelled to tell that story. And then the book just grew into so much more. And you um, tell it so bravely. And I just um, wonder, had you ever done that kind of personal writing before? Or, um, you know, it, it really is a window into some very, very personal moments in your life. And the funny thing is, is it's very awkward to like put it all out there. And mm -hmm. I remember telling my, I have an agent who helped with the book and helped sell it to the publisher and, and everything. And she's just, Sarah, this is, this is nothing. And mm -hmm. comparing it to some other memoirs <laughs> where people put even more, right, right. more personal even. So it's uh -huh. definitely an experience. I mean, it's yeah. not, not for everyone. And it's, it's really, the funny thing is, it's the kind of book I'm, I'm perfectly happy with strangers reading. Uh -huh. I definitely get squeamish if someone who already knows me reads it because it's, it's like TMI, too much info and it's not reciprocated. Uh -huh. um, I met someone once who had also written a memoir and that he described it being a little difficult though when the stranger reads it and then would come up to him later as if they really knew him, you know, and obviously in whatever, two, 300 pages, you know, you don't, you skip over certain years or, you know, so you're, you're only telling a portion, but anyway, I, I'm just interested in, have you had encounters where it almost, you know, people feel like they know you. I mean, obviously you don't right, know right. them, but. Well, I haven't had that yet, but this, the book was actually prompted by an article in the New York times about me that was kind of equally personal, but much shorter. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to, uh, it was an amateur astronomy conference and I was a speaker. It's in New Jersey and it's held mm -hmm. every year, you know, pre-pandemic. And there's a giant, like um, huge floor with people selling telescopes and people and other gadgets and people come from all over the world. And there I saw an acquaintance who I knew, but not well. And he approached me like I was his best buddy. And it took me a while to put two and two together, but it's exactly, exactly what you're saying. I think a harder thing has been that you know, people read the book and as you said, it's very personal. Parts of the book are are incredibly emotional and it's hard for them to understand. Like it was cathartic for me to write the book, but it also the events happened like 10 years ago. Right, right. Now that right. I've sort of moved past and reformed and, mm -hmm. you know, grown in a different direction. When people are reading that, I sometimes feel like they think that that's me today. Right. Yeah. And just like many memoirs, you're capturing a snapshot in time and that time is not necessarily right now. Like, if I told you, if you read the book, um, my children are in the book, not too much, but enough to sort of that right. you know that they're around and important. And they're quite young, but I bet you'd be surprised if I told you one of them's a senior graduating from college, <laughs> right. graduating from um, high school, Harvard right. Carlisle uh -huh. High School. Right. Uh -huh. You know, so it's that's what I mean. So yes, right. it's a really yeah. interesting point you made. Um, I just wanted to quote from that scene on Nashotic Hill because you describe yourself, I just thought it was a lovely image of, in the ugly throes of grief, and you say that your sorrow was your superpower, your sadness, your most extraordinary trait in the wake of losing your first husband. And um, as you say, you, you kind of tell one of the other, you, this is, an incident happens and you kind of tell one of the other women that your son's um, father has just died. And she says, well, my husband uh, recently died. Oh, I guess had died five years, but she had lost her husband too. And that's your introduction to that widow's group. Right, right. And I just wanted to um, capture that a bit for you, but it was this remarkable thing where I, you know, it's like when you're I, depressed or like in serious grief, it's like having no emotional currency. Imagine mm -hmm. your bank account is drawn. Mm -hmm. There's no money left. There's no resil There's no emotional mm -hmm. uh, backup there. And so I just, uh, you can, I had a major meltdown in public, which is not pretty. I don't, I was going to say we all do it, but I'm pretty sure we don't all do it, but all widows do it. When mm -hmm. I got to know the widows, each one had a more alarming story than the last about meltdowns, but I melted down. And this one like beautiful, radiant, shining person like walked up to me and she apparently had recognized mm -hmm. that like incredible grief inside of me. Mm -hmm. And I was screaming like, my husband died, like the kid, that's why he's misbehaving. And I wanted to capture for you how she said it. And when I said my husband died, she said, mine too. <laughs> I guess if it was a happy, fun thing. And it ended up being that her name's Melissa. Right. And I just wanted you to know we remain uh, best friends today. And you'll probably see us around town walking our, our dogs together. Um, 
I'm jumping ahead because you use this metaphor later when you win the MacArthur's Genius Fellowship. And you say, obviously, that fellowship, which comes with some um, money attached, uh, was important. But the most important fellowship in your life was this fellowship that you received from these women here in Concord who supported you through those dark times. It's so true. Um, uh, so I, I am going to turn to your professional career in a minute, but before I do, I just want to return to one of the metaphors that you use throughout the book. Um, and you say a large part of what drives you in your research for life in the universe is this notion that we are not alone. And similarly, what the widows group reminded you of here in Concord was that despite your overwhelming grief, uh, you are also not alone. So it's not really a question here, but I wonder um, when in your own mind did you make that connection between the research you were doing, I mean, it, it comes across so beautifully in the book, but I can't imagine that you were always thinking that, you know, it's connection between outer space and kind of your inner life. Right, right. Well, I had that, I always did see the parallel, but not in the way that's described in the book. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just try to capture for it for you, because most people, you know, they have the vision of the scientists in the, probably with white hair and the white lab coat and glasses, but, you know, science can be incredibly exciting and adventurous. And in part of the book, one of the themes too, it's a little buried is, you know, before I became a scientist, I used to spend a lot of time in the outdoors. And my first husband and I, we spent a lot of time in our canoe. We went to Northern Canada, like every summer we'd spend a few weeks to a couple months, just like out there in the pure wilderness, a thousand miles or more sometimes from any other, any outpost of any kind. And this sense of adventure, like going to the unknown, and being the first to see something, maybe ever, or maybe it's just first for you and other people have seen it. Mm -hmm. That's what I think about when I think about my job and astronomy and the stars. And I have the background behind me. I think I was wondering if you, Tom, have you seen a truly dark sky? You said you you go to Maine, you have a place yeah. in Maine. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, when you look it up there, it's just remarkable how much we can understand and learn. And there's still incredibly huge amounts of questions left, but with big computer facilities and computer program and math and, and physics, we can try to answer those questions. And it's really um, a journey of discovery. And so that outer, the journey of outer space and the journey of inner space, I always had them connected, but more in that sense of adventure. Mm -hmm. It was only really in the process of writing the book that like something buried in me kind of came out in the way that you were trying to summarize. Mm -hmm. um. And again, just the metaphors and the writing, I mean, you are as adept with words as I imagine you must be adept with those computer programs and um, uh, numbers that you um, have to manage uh, in your work. Uh, so let's um, go back and kind of recount, again, this is part of an exhibit um, uh, that's looking at women who have a kind of groundbreaking careers um, in their respective fields. So, uh, in terms of your childhood, you title that um, chapter, The Stargazer is Born. And uh, there's a lovely story about when you kind of first did some of that stargazing. Uh, so maybe you could just uh, tell us a little bit about the first time you discovered a beautiful night sky. Sure, sure. Well, I grew up in the inner city. So it was like we all, we, I actually I sometimes refer to Concord as the bubble town. Because uh -huh. everything looks so perfect. It's like from the outside, we're in a perfect bubble. Where I grew up was really the opposite, honestly. We should say it's in Toronto. In Toronto, Canada, in the inner city. It's all gentrified now, like many downtowns, but it was not that great of a place. So there weren't very many stars. Um, but my dad, who I lived with on weekends, he, uh, in the summertime, he always had a babysitter for us. And one summer, we had a babysitter named Tom, who was 14 years old. He was barely older than we were. And Tom's <laughs> family always went camping. And he thought, wow, well, these, ki these kids should go camping. And my dad was from the UK and he was the type of person who was often more comfortable wearing a tie on the weekend than not wearing a tie. And so it was his first and last camping trip. We drove up in the car to this, it would be like here if you drove to a campground in Maine on a lake mm -hmm. like that. It was in Ontario and it was, there was a beach and a lake and like a lot of rocky cliffs kind of and forest. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and, and I wandered outside the tent and I looked up and wow, there were just so many stars. I really hope that everyone here has, has been able to see that or can go and see it. I was lucky there was a clear night and no moon, presumably. 
I just like lost my breath for a moment. I, I had never even conceived that there was something that beautiful, that vast and that, that mysterious. Um, let's talk about your father for a minute. It's interesting, we had a forum last week with Jane Swift, who's the only woman who's been governor. She was acting governor of uh, Massachusetts. Um, and she says she's had meetings or been in forums with other women who have run for governor, Martha Coakley, Shannon O'Brien. And one thing they all uh, had in common, it's not saying that it's always the case, but was a father who really encouraged them. Um, and I know, uh, why don't you tell us just, you told us about your father wearing ties on weekends, but uh, he was also really a, a mentor to you and someone who really encouraged you to uh, pursue. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, there's many reasons why a strong father figure is so helpful. There's just a little more practical one is that in a man's world, you have to be used to and comfortable interacting with men. I mean, that's a big one, but yes, having the support. My father was incredibly eccentric. He would accuse me of being eccentric. <laughs> he had, <laughs> you know, uh, crazy big ideas and he really brought me up to to step up to, okay, I, I have this big thing on teaching women confidence and I run a lot of programs on helping women overcome the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. But my dad, I was extremely low confidence, low self-esteem. And my dad really pushed me to overcome that. And he always, he was a huge believer in the power of positive thinking. Mm -hmm. you know, today we know athletes, they spend a lot of time visualizing their success in a very specific way. And he really believed in that principle. So he inspired me and taught me, you know, he taught me not just to have big dreams, but a strategy, like a scaffolding, if you will, on, on how to reach those. And so he was very supportive and adoring. And I, I actually just wish everyone had that kind of, that kind of unconditional love from, from a parent. I enjoyed the stories uh, again. And uh, but you're a bit of a renegade for a period. And you tell a story in seventh grade you were at a private school and they had very strict rules and um, you thought it was kind of silly that you couldn't walk across the street and go to the bakery. Right, right, and, I can tell uh, that story. Um, well, yeah, so for some reason, my dad thought I should go to a private school. And I'd been in the public school system all along. And I think that when I went to the private school, it was the first indication that I was a very independent thinker. And this was for grade seven. So I think I would have been maybe 12 years old. But I had been used to taking the bus, the subway, walking through the city myself. My brother and sister and I, when we were little kids, my mother had first got divorced and moved to the inner city. We traveled like 25 miles by subway to go to our, our school so we could wrap up the year and the next year. I was always alone wandering around at a very young age. And so then at age 12, I went to the school. And what I found was, was shocking to me because I'd been pretty much left alone. But the girls were really forced to conform, actually, in many different ways. I just was shocked, really, that that was a thing, actually. And one of the rules they said was grade seven and under was the junior school. And you were not allowed to leave school property. But it was like a tiny school property because the, the city, there's not, like here in Concord, we have these ginormous sports fields. Like in that city, you just don't. I mean, I don't even think there was even a playground to my, I can't even remember. Anyway, so I just decided, well, rules are, I don't know why they have this rule. I mean, I'm just going to cross the street and get some lunch because I didn't have lunch that day. So I went to the bakery across the street and I got in so much trouble for breaking the rule. Mm -hmm. It actually went from bad to worse. And eventually I had to leave the school. I shook it up a little and the other girls started finding their own independence. Mm -hmm. And the school right. didn't look bad. <laughs> and then, by the way, they started doing bad things that I ended up getting blamed for. Right. <laughs> but I think no. it was good all around that people got to exercise some freedom. You said the principal saw you as a catalyst for rebellion among the other girls. Uh, but then also, uh, when you go back to the public high school, you get excellent grades because you are so intellectually gifted. But even then, you said you, um, you know, kind of hung out with what we would think of as a kind of rougher crowd, a slightly rootless, rootless crowd, although they didn't realize that you were doing as well. And um, your classes, I think, until you graduated top of your class. But um, well, I think every teenager goes through, well, not everyone, most teenagers go through a rebellious phase. Mm -hmm. I think here we've been really limited during COVID. Kids can't mm -hmm. go anywhere. But back in the city where I grew up, there's like a lot of public transportation. So you could always get around. And I don't know how it happened, but somehow just for about a year or so, I fell in like with this crowd of teenagers that every weekend, huge, like growing numbers of them would assemble and like, go somewhere. This was in the warm weather when you could, could be outdoors. And 
after a while, I just decided it wasn't for me. I decided to be more studious. And yeah, I studied really hard. You would love Canada because all the angst that the teenagers here have, they try to get it. Some of them throw away their high school life just to get into what they perceive as, as a good college. But in Canada, we didn't have that. I, I don't know that they have that now, but only one year of grades counts for college. Mm. So when I came up to that year, I realized I had to study really hard, unlike mm. previous years. And I did, and I came up with some top grades and got some prizes that I, I didn't even know existed. And that's when the kids from this like popular crowd um, just told me I was too smart, that they couldn't, they got yeah. dropped. Uh, we'll go back a year to, um... So uh, it was at age 15 that you attended a presentation at the University of Toronto about the discovery of a supernova, and then you got a summer job. Maybe just tell us what you did with your the money that you earned in that summer job. Well, I had a summer job, and I bought a telescope. Hmm. Just a really small telescope. It was maybe three or four inches in diameter. And what's amazing about being in the city, and here in Concord as well, you can do this, if you have a small telescope is you can point it at the planets like Jupiter and Saturn. And with Jupiter, you can see the moons. With Saturn, depending on its orientation that year, you can see its rings. Mm. And it was um, really, uh, it was just fun. It was hard though, super cold out in the winter, <laughs> fiddling with the telescope trying to get so, it to work, but it was just so fun. It's interesting that you're an astrophysicist now, but you said initially your high school physics class was difficult until something happened. Maybe you can relay that. To yeah, well, I've watched my son take physics and I now know why it's a struggle. It was a struggle for me. It's, I think, a struggle for most people. It's really tough and it's not, you know, we, we have to reinvent how we teach it if we want people to like it. Here, there's this unusual thing where he's taking AP physics at the Concord Carlisle High School, but he never took physics before. Mm. Then you go from zero to AP physics and mm. actually find it enjoyable or like it. It's just really hard all around. But something cool that my teacher did was he held up a big board across the room and the board had a hole in it. And I want you to imagine that you're given a spring. And you just stand across the room and shoot the spring so that it goes to try to get it through the hole. Now I'm sure a lot of you could just figure that out kind of intuitively, but we weren't allowed to do that. We had to measure how springy the spring was and we had to use equations that we had learned in class. And all we were allowed to do, and we knew the distance away, and we knew the, how springy the spring was, and all we, and we knew we have gravity, Earth's gravity. All we were allowed to do was choose the angle. And we had to measure the angle, and the angle was the only thing we had, and we had to shoot the spring. So my turn came up near the end of the, end of the line, and I was far away, and I had the angle, and I shot the spring, and wow, it went through the hole. And this was, just imagine how exciting that is, that you can use an equation to describe something around you and use that equation to make a prediction that actually works out. It was like a lightning bolt that all of a sudden I understood just how awesome physics can be. Uh, I just got to read a, book, a sentence from the book that was lovely. Um, so uh, it's related to your love of physics and astronomy, especially astronomy. You write, why stars instead of horses or boys or hockey? I don't know, I don't know. Maybe it is because stars are the antithesis of, or antithesis of darkness, of abusive stepfathers and imperiled little sisters. Stars are light, stars are possibility. They are the places where science and magic meet, windows to worlds greater than my own. So the title of the book is The Smallest Lights in the Universe. And you often pay, play with this notion of light, that light can help us see, but sometimes the light of the stars and the sun can be blinding. And I just wondered, perhaps you can comment here on how you came up with the title. And um, I know there's kind of a number of meanings, but why did you decide to name your memoir, The Smallest Lights in the Universe? Well, it really has two distinctive meanings actually. And of course it's always open for, we, like it's great if you come up with your own meaning for the mm -hmm. title after you read, read the book. But one thing is in my job, you know, myself and other people in my community, we're searching for another earth. And all of those stars you see behind me, or you see in the night sky, every star is the sun. And if our sun has planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, etc., you expect those other stars to have planets also, and they do. And we know of thousands of planets. But you know what's really interesting is none of these other planetary systems 
None of them are like our solar system. It turns out our solar system appears to be quite rare. And we really struggle to find another Earth. Earths are so small, so less massive, so dim compared to the star that they're right beside. That we call those Earths the smallest lights in the universe. And the heart of the story is that, you know, we're all searching for something. We're all trying to go somewhere and do something. And that's, that's part of the, the search. But the other meaning is more somber, actually. And that is for anyone here who's been depressed, like seriously depressed or like in grief. I hope you haven't. You know, everyone has a bit of it. But when you like fall off that cliff into the dark hole, what gets you out of that? It's hope. That's another theme in the book. But it's the smallest glimmers of hope. You have to hold on to those. And that's also what, it, what the title's for, the smallest lights in the universe are those tiny glimmers of hope that you can hold on to, to try to make life better. In your acknowledgments, you um, thank uh, the artist who designed the cover and because it's a, kind of a silhouette of a mother with her two boys. And um, to me, there's also that kind of theme of, you know, our children are in some ways are, you know, um, lights in the universe that we have to protect and care for. Um, right, I really like that. Uh, so let me just quickly uh, fast forward. You've got your undergraduate degree in math and physics at the University of Toronto, an internship at a local observatory. And then as you said, to balance your academic work, you joined the Wilderness Canoe Association. And that's where you met the man, um, Mike Webrick, who would become your first husband. You're right, he was an editor, quote, who worked with words the way I study light. We both spent a lot of time inside our own heads trying to bend elusive things into shape. We found that we could be alone together. It's a lovely mm -hmm. term. Um, graduate school at Harvard, uh, when Swiss astronomers found the first widely recognized exoplanet, which a term that um, you somewhat described already and Allison used, but maybe again, can you kind of define what an exoplanet is for our viewers? Yes, an exoplanet is a planet that orbits a star other than the sun. And like I said, just like our sun has planets, you know, Earth orbits our sun, so this is Mercury, Mars, Venus. We think that every star has a planetary system. And in the last few decades, astronomers have found thousands of planets actually. And honestly, there's probably trillions of planets in our galaxy alone. So um, again, as uh, late as the 1990s, exoplanets were largely theoretical, um, but there was some logic that dictated they might be there, but there was no proof. Um, right, right, and you know what the logic was? It turns out the logic was that part of astronomy is using the Hubble Space Telescope and other telescopes. We see stars being born. And when these young stars are being born, they always have a leftover, leftover stuff, a disk orbiting them. And this disk is gas and dust, and it inevitably forms planets, has to form planets. That's where the logic and the physics lies. That's why we expected to find planets. So this is a quick aside, but in reading the book, um, the names of these exoplanets are, are uh, for, for a lay person, <laughs> it's hard to see, like, it's not like the Dewey Decibel system or something, where, or, or is there a logic to it? No, that, there's a logic, but it's not pretty. And we'd love to name <laughs> the, the planets after our friends or children, like <laughs> asteroids. You can get asteroid named after you. But these stars, the planets actually, they're just named after the star. So let's take the Big Dipper, for example. If you have, it's Ursa Majoris. And if there's a star, the stars are named in order of their brightness. And so you might have Ursa Majoris. Um, let's say alpha, and you just put a little b beside that name for the first planet. I see. And then you'd have a C, D, E, F, G, but that's not in order of the planet being away from the star. It's in the order of discovery. Okay. So it could go B, C, D. Now, to make it more complicated, many stars don't have names. They're not stars that the Greeks named. They're not stars that astronomers, like in the early 1900s, saw and put into catalogs. And so then we name the star and planet at the same time, and we name the, the star after the survey that found it. So NASA had a special telescope called Kepler, named after the, the scientist Johannes Kepler. So if Kepler found a planet, it had to name the star first, then the planet. So you'd have Kepler 10b. 
Hmm. And if there was another planet found in that same system of it later, it would be Kepler 10 C. Hmm. Well, that makes a little more sense than um, when I was uh, reading the book. Uh, I should note we're about uh, halfway through our conversation. As Allison said, if you have questions, uh, please submit them via the chat feature and Allison will text them uh, to us. And Sarah actually has them on her phone. So she'll see your questions or comments as well. Um, I thought we maybe just pause and ask this larger existential question. You've somewhat already um, uh, touched upon it, but um, uh, you write, the greatest discovery astronomers could possibly make is that we are not alone. To see something else inhabiting another earth has always been the dream. But just tell us a little bit more about what it is that drives your, this sense of wonder and discovery and you know, gets you to take the train into MIT every day and do the work that yeah. you do. Well, the train's a whole other story. For those folks who hear that commute, you know it's not not as reliable as it used to be. It's really hard to say. I mean, I think I just love exploring. I love new things. And just the fact that we're we're the first generation in human history that has the tools to to search for signs of life on other worlds. I just find that really exciting. Um, I was intrigued with a statement you made, uh, and you said, Many of us who are not scientists would be surprised at how much pioneering science relies on intuition. But tell us a little bit more, maybe give an anecdote that explains. Sure, I can. Intuition. Well, today. you know, it's always that inner voice. And some of us have it more, some of us listen to our inner voice more than others. But imagine you're, you know, going on a trip to Boston and you encounter this kind of shady situation. You just feel really uncomfortable with the people that you're bumping into. You need to do something about that, turn around and leave and just get out of there. But there's also intuition for a good problem. You know, there's sometimes um, like data that other people think is wrong or have overlooked. And you just have this inner voice with this intuition that you feel like this is a good problem. And it's same with the solution. Like I'm sure if it, each of you stop to think about it when you have a problem and sometimes you're just... Um, outside walking or in the shower, or just this or that, like not really paying attention and an idea just pops into your head or a solution to a hard problem. It's really hard for me to capture that. I don't know if I did a good enough job, but that's intuition. It's just for science problems and solutions. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about the role of uh, gender and comes in different places in the book. And, um, but just in this um, question, uh, so let's let's stay early in your career when you were having your first um, you know uh, thoughts and intuition. Did you find that your colleagues, male and female, would take them as seriously as others? Um, or early in your career, was you know were were your suggestions um, not taken as seriously? Well, I think I was really lucky because I was a graduate student at Harvard, as you mentioned. And the groups that I found myself associated with were really forward thinking. And so there, and at my job when I finished, uh, when I graduated from Harvard, it was also a very forward thinking place. And so early on, I don't, I mean, I don't remember, I don't notice if I found anything, but no, actually. And one thing I found that helped, and I think this applies even outside of science, was Again, back to my dad, you know, I loved my dad and most of the people in the field were older men. And it turned out I accidentally got a mentor who had a daughter who was just around my age. And I found that the men, if you work for them, if they're your boss or your, or your mentor, and if they have grown up daughters, they want their daughters to succeed. So as long as you're much younger than the mentor, they actually really support you. And so I don't think I had a problem early on. on like it might sound surprising to you, but it's only as I've gotten older and more right. successful. Like I've closed that age gap, then people find it threatening. And so I feel like I've had a lot more problems now than when I was younger. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you about that in a minute. Let's just go back to, so you're at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, again, where Einstein himself, you know, um, resided and did his work. And maybe you could tell the story about the first time where you uh, were introduced to kind of the cutthroat nature of scientific research and what happened to you and your female colleague with a discovery that you were um, trying to publish. Right. And, you know, we can always put things through a gender lens, but we can never really be sure if it is. But we were my, um, okay, so my friend Gabriella and I, we were doing this incredibly ambitious project. We were searching for planets, exoplanets in a brand new way. 
And we were kind of racing against the clock against other teams around the world. And what we were doing was you're we looking at a large field of stars, like tens of thousands of stars at one time. And we were looking for stars that had a tiny drop in brightness that would drop in brightness because planet would have just happened to go in front of it as seen from our telescope. We call these transits. This is a brand new technique. No planet had ever been found that way. And we had to work really hard. We worked like around the clock. It was a wonderful time, really, really, uh, really invigorating. Well, this colleague of mine, Gabriella, she was at the university, the adjacent university, Princeton University. And we were postdocs, so we had just finished our PhD. We were like in our late 20s, or early 30s age. And she had been sharing the details of our code and all the things we were doing with a much older male professor. I think he was being very encouraging. And I think she saw him as like an advisor type. Well, we didn't find out till later in the summer that he had the exact same program on a different telescope. And he was just sucking up this one way flow of information, which by the way, he didn't need us. You know, he was a professor and very accomplished and the people on his team were world experts in, in measuring brightnesses of stars. So he didn't need to do this. It was incredibly deflating and discouraging and crushing that someone wouldn't disclose that in this to a much younger person, just uh, enjoying the, trying to enjoy the thrill of the, the journey. Uh, around that time, 2003, NASA launched the Spitzer Telescope. Can you just maybe describe to us you know, why that was such a breakthrough and maybe even a bit more about Lyman Spitzer and what his vision was? Sure, well, we all know of the Hubble Space Telescope. But you might not know that NASA had four, four telescopes that were like flagship telescopes. And one of the telescopes was called the Spitzer Space Telescope, which was like Hubble, but smaller, and it worked in the infrared. It was named after Lyman Spitzer. He was uh, actually a professor at Princeton, and he's not alive now, of course, but he was one of the people who literally invented the Hubble Space Telescope and who championed it for, for decades until it was finally launched. And what was really important about this was we can use the telescope to study exoplanets because planets that go in front of the star, as seen from the telescope, you know, they also go behind the star. We have some planets that are so close to the star, as heated by the star, they're incredibly hot, thousands of degrees in their temperature. And when that planet and star are seen together, we can't spatially separate them, so they're just like one blob. When the planet goes behind the star, we actually see a tiny drop in infrared brightness. And through, it's a little complicated, but we can actually measure the temperature of a star using the Spitzer Space Telescope. That telescope's no longer operational. It was a huge breakthrough for us to, to study exoplanets. Um, and maybe, and then I, I, I do wanna show the, the fun posters, but maybe we should jump ahead a little bit about the star shield. Um, and, uh, yes, well, Spitzer did this other incredibly forward thinking thing actually. And he also invented what we call starshade. And starshade is a giant specially shaped screen, tens of meters in diameter, It'd be like 30 meters in diameter. And remember there's about three feet per meter. So it's like 90 feet, that's huge. And starshade would be attached to a spacecraft and it would be in outer space. And it would work with a telescope. So you'd have a space telescope and then starshade. And remember, starshade is tens of meters in diameter, and it has to fly in formation with a telescope, but spaced out tens of thousands of kilometers. And they have to be lined incredibly precisely. And the job of starshade is to block out the starlight so we can see the planets directly. Now, it's like on a bright sunny day when you, you know, put your hand against the sun, like that actually, but very sophisticated, very well planned. And Lemon Spitzer had worked this all out mathematically, but we couldn't build it back in the 60s. And what's so amazing is that each decade, someone tried to revive the starshade concept. And the story unfolds in the book, actually, in my role in it, that I got to lead the starshade at a time when, when NASA actually wanted to kill the starshade. They wanted mm -hmm. to study all the ways we could find another Earth. And it's good business practice if a way is going to be a dead end to shelve it. And I believe the original plan was that Starshade would prove to be unwieldy, not buildable, but we proved opposite actually. 
And now Starshade, is a, it's not funded yet, but it's a major contender for the future. And one of the stories that kind of takes your heart away, heart away in the book is when you get the letter that asks you to be the chair of this very prestigious group, uh, maybe just tell the story, you, you get a call from one of your colleagues who thinks a mistake has been made. Right. Well, there's sort of a little more nuance to it. And when you asked me at the beginning how I felt about writing the memoir, I really didn't, I thought a lot about whether I should put this story in the book because I didn't want to say something bad about other people. And I even like this person. So it's not, but I had a team like editor, this, that, and the other, and people essentially wanted the story in there. Well, and there's one more background I want to give you that in science, sometimes we feel like that when we work really hard on a project or an idea that we gave birth to that idea. And we often feel like we own the idea. But in science, you know, we don't make a lot of money. We just have our ideas, but we put them out there for other people to work on. And the individual we're talking about worked on Starshade and brought it back. To, he was one of the people that revisited it one decade and literally brought it back to life. And he was angry that I got chosen by NASA to lead the Starshade for that. There, there were a number of years when I was in charge of it, um, bringing the community together, making Starshade a feasible, into a feasible mission. He was very angry that he wasn't chosen. And so he called me and he just got mad. And he said that he th that thinks NASA made a mistake. They should have chosen him. And he specifically said, I should call them and tell them that he should actually be the one to lead this. He got really mad at me, but it's partly his personality. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if you know someone that, like, I didn't take it too personally. I mean, I didn't cry or anything. I didn't, but I was just like, I mean, obviously it's, you know, it's sort of uh, my turn now. And, mm -hmm. and that's just, you know, bad behavior right there, calling someone and yelling at them. Right. Um, let's, we're, we're running out of time and I want to go to some questions from the audience, but uh, these posters are kind of fun. Do you want to set the posters up while Allison, um, and we'll just go through them quickly, Sarah. Just, sure, uh, sure. Well, it's so hard to communicate my work and others' work that we, um, we like to il make illustrations and get artists on board to help communicate what we're thinking. This one's about Venus. It's not one about an exoplanet, but perhaps you can move on. You can flip through them. But NASA actually decided to make some retro travel posters, like imagining that we have a way to go to these planets. And they have a sort of this beautiful series of posters. These are ones for our solar system, but we have some for, for exoplanets as well. And so they're just sort of, here's one. Relax on Kepler 16b, the land of two suns, where your shadow always has company. And it's supposed to capture for you that, you know, there are, there are star systems where there's a binary star, two stars orbiting each other. And outside of that, there's a planet orbiting those stars. Here's another one, Kepler 186f, where the grass is always redder on the other side. And in this case, they're imagining the astronauts or the tourists go to another planet. And this is a planet around a red dwarf star, a star that's much smaller and redder than our own sun. And they're just imagining for fun that the vegetation would be a different color. And this is maybe the last one, but it says experience the gravity of HD 40307G. So remember HD 40307, that's a star in the Henry Draper catalog. And G means we already found a B, C, D, E, F, G. So it's the sixth planet in that system. Here's one that we started, you started out with that is a, a planet, it's got a really complicated name, but this is the planet, <laughs> visit the planet with no star. And that's why it looks so dark because there's no star. It says where the nightlife never ends. Great, thanks, Allison. Um, so uh, again, just to kind of round out the story because it's a very beautiful one where you um, meet the man who is uh, currently your husband, um, but um, and uh, we have a sense you, you have a um, uh, well that this that this quote is actually about when you're with your first husband you moved to Concord and you said we finished building our own solar system with its own discrete centers of gravity two boys and three cats living in a pretty yellow house but since we're in Concord and we have a Concord based audience I'm just interested how you and your first husband decided to um, locate here in Concord. <laughs> 
why we're lucky to have well, you. There's a really straightforward reason, and perhaps a lot of you share it, but we wanted to live in a walkable town. Mm. We didn't want to live in the city. We wanted to live in a, like a suburb, if you will, but somewhere we could walk. And we were lucky to snatch a house right in the town center mm. where um, a lady was actually selling it on her own. And it was, it was, had been on sale for about two years. It was, she was struggling to sell it, but we could hear it's wonderful because we can walk to Crosby's, we can walk to the library, walk to the schools, walk to the train. Wanted somewhere I could walk to the train and take a train to work. So it was mostly just the charm and the, partly the charm, but honestly, it was mostly just for a practical reason. We wanted a walkable town near the train and near the Montessori school we wanted to send our kids to. Um, you've referenced it, but uh, maybe talk a little bit about how, as your career progressed, you found you hit a different type of class ceiling um, and why you, you, you somewhat suggested it before, but maybe another couple of sentences about what, what that's been like. You were named a MacArthur Genius Grant, recognized by Time Magazine, uh, and yet in some ways the competition with uh, your peers got more intense. I just find people feel threatened by me. I don't really have another explanation for it, but a lot of people, um, especially in, in, I don't know, I'm really not sure. I'm still thinking through all of this actually. Uh -huh. I go to places and be snubbed or people just clearly treat the men better. And I think they just feel uncomfortable now. It's one thing uh -huh. if you're much younger and you remind them of their daughter. Uh -huh. But when you start to, I think, succeed beyond uh, these other folks, they just find it threatening. I don't really have a better explanation. And um, I'm intrigued, you know, maybe it's not scientific, but just anecdotally, uh, both at MIT in your department or when you go to conferences, what, what percentage these days are female astrophysicists? In my specific subfield of exoplanets, there's a good number of women actually. Mm -hmm. And I and others work hard behind the scene to kind of keep the numbers up. But it's um, not many, you know, in engineering fields, I'm still often, it's myself and one of the students on the team who are women, and it's, it's really not, not enough, not very many. MIT mm -hmm. does really well, though, because they try to be as objective as possible, no matter how hard that is, and look at numbers and data. So MIT does well. Let me ask a few of the questions that have come in, and uh, Sarah, you may not have all of them, because some, some of them come in on Allison's um... Uh, female account, but with all the light pollution, do you fear for the opportunity for young people to see and be inspired by the night sky? Well, it's less the light pollution than helping our young people get out of the city and get away from their phones. And I think that's really the key <laughs> if we could get more people out there. Right. And even in the dark, even in the polluted or the, you know, we can still see some amazing things like our planet Venus goes through phases just like the moon does, and you can look at it and literally see a crescent planet. Mm. So I'm not as worried about light pollution. I'm more worried about people just getting out there. There was a time when women faculty at MIT complained they were not treated fairly compared with their male colleagues. Remarkably, the administration concluded that they were right. Do you have any you know, impressions about um, what things are like now at MIT? Yes, well, this report that they're referring to is from the 1990s, when this is why I love MIT that some of the women got together and they were pretty unhappy in general and they tried to understand why. And they realized they had less resources, you know, less pay, smaller laboratories. And they went to the Dean and instead of the Dean brushing them off, he's like, let's check this. And MIT is all about numbers and logic. So they checked it and it was true and they rectified it. So I think now, um, you know, the, the, there's still a lot of issues going on actually, but and I know a lot of the women who were part of that original study. So it's still not perfect, but I do like to think it's a lot better. I actually am treated very well. I don't have anything to complain about myself. And there's quite a remarkable part of the book before you got the MacArthur grant and you were a single mom and trying to balance everything where your dean, you know, really wanted to encourage you not only intellectually, but provided more resources and essentially to help you kind of with the work life balance issues that you were confronting? Well, we're, we'll run out of time to get into this in detail, but it's very hard to be an ambitious career woman. Mm -hmm. It is honestly nearly impossible to keep all the balls juggling. And as a single mom, you know, with no, there's no divorced dad down the street who can take the kids on the weekend. Right. There's like, like the cost of working is prohibitive. 
Mm. For me to be able to work and focus full time on my job, I had to spend so much money just on household help. And I had my wonderful um, babysitters who are, they're still family. You know who's going to my son Max's graduation? It's the women who are our, our extended family babysitters now. And some of them have children of their own today, but they're um, like just the amount of, you know, if, and we travel a lot in this field to exchange ideas with our colleagues and some people travel to telescopes, but how do you travel when you have no family nearby mm. or family that can visit to take care of the kids? And so just like the cost of even going away overnight, it's just, yeah. So I went to my Dean and I was, it was just an incredible low point. And I had gone to him about a different topic entirely. But he just said, how are you? And I just was like, I just, I, I just told him it's just impossible. And again, they just went looking for a practical solution. He just said, how much do you need? And he generously gave me a salary supplement um, so I could get by. It went, the salary supplement goes away. It's not forever. But they do something clever there where as though he wanted to give it to me, he told other people that they had to pay for part of it, other people at the university. <laughs> so it's sort of a win-win. And again, we haven't been able to do justice to either of your husbands who you write so lovingly, but the support that they've provided to you and your sons. Um, uh, this questioner says, you're a brilliant scientist who's written a beautiful book. What are your thoughts about the connection between science and art? There's a lot of connection. I mean, people often don't think of science as creative, but there's a lot of creativity in, in science, actually. Sometimes we even meld them together. On the MIT, the MIT led NASA mission tests, we have a wonderful young person named Natalia Guerrero, and she put on a, a um, like a music, music art inspired by, by planets. Mm -hmm. So there's overlap for sure. So here's a big question, brace yourself. Thank you for your sensitive description of the joy and awe that the stars bring you and all of us. When you see the depth and intricacies of the universe, do you sense a higher power in the universe? I don't sense a higher power in terms of a person out there who's you know all deciding for us, but I do feel the awe and power of nature. Um, uh, here's a question. How will, I, I may go back to that point in a moment. How will the low earth orbit satellites currently being launched affect your work or will, will they affect your work? Wow. Astronomers are very worried about this. You know, when you think about, you know, building a building in a protected area, there has to be environmental study and there's been no environmental study on, on the thousands. There's tens of thousands of satellites going to be launched for Starlink you know, we're all going to love it. We're going to love the internet. We're going to have all the time everywhere, but it's definitely damaging for astronomy. And astronomers have done very distinctive studies. Now, as long as these satellites are relatively low, like let's say they're well, they're under 700 kilometers altitude above the surface, they mostly affect twilight, like dawn and dusk. But if people want to put them up, this is a technical detail, but I'm just trying to explain uh, mm -hmm. that people have thought about it very carefully. If they want to put the satellites up at a thousand kilometers above Earth, we'll see them much more throughout the night. And in astronomy, we're doing bigger telescopes. There's one about to come online called the Vera Rubin Observatory. And the Rubin Observatory will monitor like giant patches of the sky continuously. It's those kind of works that people worry about because they get mm -hmm. streaks across their observations. So it's not good news for astronomers. And um, tell us a little bit, I've um, heard you speak before about, you know, we, many of us still have this romantic notion of an astronomer on the top of a mountain in Colorado with a telescope, but more and more your work is really behind a computer screen running yeah. numbers. Can you explain you know, that to Astronomers us? rarely go to the telescope now. If you build an instrument, you'll go and commission your instrument but there are people trained to operate the telescope. And just like, you know, we've all been on Zoom and many of us have worked remotely, we work remotely. And even before the pandemic, you know, so I would be here and imagine Tom, you're the telescope operator. And then I would have a control software on my computer so I could command the telescope to move or to take an exposure. So we do, we really mostly just work with um, data on our computer. And just describe the thrill of, what is it you see on your screen that makes you realize that's I've just seen something or discovered something or you know what I'm well, saying? 
You know, there's rarely that aha moment, just like so perfect. Ah, okay. But there's a sense of satisfaction in just completing a task. Mm-hmm. And so you'll get data, but then you have to kind of clean it up. We call it detrending. Then we'll make a model and try to match the data or find all possible models that match the data. It's mostly, um, right now I'm stuck on a puzzle that's really curious and it just feels good to like peel away the layers of the onion to try to get to the bottom of the problem. Um, I actually wanted to read a quote from Thoreau, but it's somewhat in response to the lovely story you tell about discovering the green flash with your um, current husband, Charles in Hawaii. Can you, can you describe what that green flash is and how he helped you to see it? Yes, well, I'd like you all to think about a rainbow for a moment. And imagine the rainbow setting, like as the sun sets. And what would happen if you could imagine a rainbow setting is that the last color of the rainbow would be all by itself. And what the green flash is, it's when you have perfect conditions, the sun is setting. But the sun, um, it refracts. It's like its light is split up into a miniature rainbow, if you will, that you can't really see with your eyes. And so when the sun is setting, the very last color you can see is green. And so all the, the other part of the sun, the yellow, the orange, the red, that is set. There's like a split second when the green light is remaining. And if the conditions are just right, right the second that the most of the sun has set, you can see the most perfect emerald green. It's the most brilliant green ever. And I'd read about this when I was nine years old and I wanted to see this my entire life. And I'd been to a place where I could see it. I was in, it's kind of a long story, but I was over the Mediterranean with at a work trip and the person beside me saw it and I didn't see it. So it's actually quite hard to see. And if you're staring at the sun, your eyes will get blinded and you won't see it. So it's like timing and it's weather and you have to know what to look for. Well, my husband, Charles is so wonderful. I, I'm hoping some people here know him. If you go to the dog park, you'll, you'll know him. He's the tall one with the white dog, Leo. And Charles is an amateur astronomer. In fact, we met at an astronomy conference and he knows how to see everything. The amateurs, you know, they often do, they're better than the professionals at how to see and when to see. And we were in Hawaii together and he felt a lot of pressure because he knew I really wanted to see this. It was like a big deal for me. And he's seen it so many times. And it was the perfect night. And it turned out to be, you need a very long horizon. So you have to be looking over the ocean it's hard to see from an airplane, but that's another one. Or you have to be on a mountaintop. You have to have a huge long horizon that's unpolluted. So after a big storm would be a good time. And it was perfect. And the sun was setting and I wasn't looking because he was going to burn his eyes out for me. And he said, now. And I looked and I saw the perfect green flash. It is real and it is amazing. Um, this is a different phenomenon and it's a few sentences, but I hope the audience will, you Sarah will bear with me. But This is uh, uh, Henry David Thoreau. We had a remarkable sunset one day last November. I was walking in the meadow, the source of Nut Meadow Brook, when the sun at last, just before setting, after a cold gray day, reached a clear stratum in the horizon, and the softest, brightest morning sunlight fell on the dry grass and on the stems of the trees in the opposite horizon, and on the leaves of the shrub oaks on the hillside, while our shadows stretched long over the meadow eastward as if it were the only motes in its beams. It was such a light as we could not have imagined a moment before, and the air was so warm and serene that nothing was wanting to make a paradise of that meadow. When we reflected that this was not a solitary phenomenon, never to happen again, but that it would happen forever and ever, an infinite number of evenings, and cheer and reassure the latest child that walked there, it was more glorious still." But anyway, this notion of these natural phenomenon that kind of connect us to one another, connect us to this higher power of nature and to connect us across the generations. Um, uh, It's really been lovely to talk to you, Sarah. Anything that I didn't ask you or any points that you want to share with our audience before we say good, it's fine if if there are not, but uh, before we say good night. I think you did a great job in covering covering a lot of ground. Great, I wanna end with a quote of yours. It's the last quote of the book. I don't think it's an accident that there's a mirror at the heart of every telescope. If we wanna find another earth, that means we wanna find another us. We think we're worth knowing. We wanna be a light in somebody else's sky 
And so long as we keep looking for each other, we will never be alone. So thank you, Sarah, for this enlightening discussion, for this wonderful memoir, which illuminates your story and the search for life, much like a flashlight guides our way in a summer field under an enveloping night sky. It's really a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we thank all of you for watching. And uh, we, as Allison said, we hope you'll join us on um, Thursday night. The focus will actually be looking at Rachel Carson, uh, a crusading environmentalist in the 1960s, and then other women who were part of the civil rights movement of the 1960s uh, with a historian, business school professor, Harvard historian, 